Hello everybody and welcome to World Storytelling Cafe. I'm glad to be here again today sharing stories with people all over the world and being part of a community, the World Storytelling Cafe, um, where there are storytellers from every continent. So just once more I'd like to thank the people who set it up, the wonderful John Rowe, along with um, colleagues in Morocco, Mike and Leslie, that should have been Mike and Lucy, <laughs> sorry Lucy, and with people in Romania who are making the technical thing happen, happen. Julio, I'd like to thank you all and thank everyone who's involved and thank you for tuning in and listening. So I'm talking today from my little house, my little wooden house which I built myself. This house is on a hill and I'm in London. I'm on a hill overlooking London. But I thought today I'd like to, as well as telling some stories here in my house, take us out and perhaps look at some places in London where I'll be telling a story or two. But to start off today, I'd like to start with a story from Syria. And it's a story I learned from a person who dedicated her life to gathering stories from Syria. And her name is Muna Imadeh. She died a few years ago, tragically quite young, but she's left a legacy of stories from Syria, and this is one of them. There was once a farmer and his wife. Well, farmer is quite a, a, a term. He, he didn't have much to farm. He had a tiny little piece of land. He had a cow which wasn't giving much milk, a little bit of milk each day. He had a sheep and he had a hen that laid maybe one egg a day, if they were lucky, two eggs, but life was hard. But he decided that he would try and do something and make sure that his field would produce as many vegetables as possible. Now he had a problem because his wife was a chatterbox. She would go down to the market and she'd tell everybody all of their business. Oh, the hen, hen is only giving one egg, blah, 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 my husband this, I blah. And he was embarrassed. He didn't want everyone to know their business. But she would tell everything. She couldn't keep a secret. Well, he walked out of the farm. He, he passed the barn where the cow was and the sheep was and the hen was. And he walked to his little patch of land. And he was digging and digging and digging and clunk! He suddenly hit something. So he dug around it. And to his enormous surprise, he saw that there was a little metal box with a lid. When he opened it, he saw it was full of coins. <gasps> wow! We'll be... Oh! And then he started thinking, the landlord, the chief of the village, if he finds out about this, he will come here and say, that is my money on my land. Uh, uh, uh. I'm not going to tell my wife about it, but what can I do? And counter to what you might think, he did something very strange. He went back to the house and he said to his wife, 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 come and look. I've found something and you'll be so interested in it. And so he took his wife past the barn to the little piece of land. And he dug where he'd covered it over to make sure no one found it. He dug and showed her the little metal box. And when he opened it and showed her... The gold coin, she was beside herself. We'll be rich, it's marvellous, I'm wonderful. Yes, but my dear, what I'd like you to do now is go back to the house and make some food for us because I've a little bit of work to do and I'll join you later. OK, I'm so... And off she went, delighted. Well, the man made sure that he'd buried the box once more and he went back to the farmyard to the barn. Now in the barn there was the cow which didn't give much milk, the chicken which only gave one or two eggs, and the sheep which they were hoping they could save for Eid. 
After Ramadan, they would have a big feast and share it with their friends. But he thought, uh-uh, no, this is not the time to keep that sheep. I'm going to have to kill it and cook it now. And he slaughtered the sheep. And he cooked the sheep, he roasted it, and he chopped all the pieces into little bits. Now he knew his wife always came out of the house at five o'clock to milk the cow. Even though they only got about a cupful, she did it regular as clockwork. And so he took all those little bits of roasted delicious meat in a big bag and he climbed up on the roof. Five o'clock came and she came out of the door just at the moment when he started throwing down all the little bits of meat. And she said, it's raining meat, it's raining meat. And she ran to pick up all the pieces and dust off any sand that there might be on them. And she took it back into the house. He came down from the roof, waited a little while. And when he went into the house, oh, she told him about the rain, the rain that was raining meat, the meat rain, whatever you'd like to call it. And they had a wonderful meal and they slept well that night. Well, next morning, of course, she went down to the market and next morning, everybody in the market had learned that they had found gold on their land. And it didn't take long before the landlord, the chief of the village, heard about it. And it didn't take long before he knocked on their door when they were both at home. They came out of the house to greet the landlord. Assalamu alaikum, ahla wa sahlan kef alhamdulillah. And all the niceties were exchanged. And the landlord came to the point. I hear you've got gold. You found gold on the land. No, we haven't found gold on the land. Oh yes we have, said his wife. Don't you remember we found the gold on the land when the day that it was raining meat. And the landlord looked at the woman and said, what did you say? Could you say that again? Yes, we found gold on the land on the day that the, 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 the meat was raining from the sky. It was a wonderful day. And he thought, I'm not going to bother this strange woman anymore. It's quite clear she doesn't know what's going on and she's making up stories. And off he went. The husband made sure that he would only take a little bit of money every week or so, just so that the wife didn't get suspicious. And that is the story of raining meat, which comes from Syria. Well, I think now it's probably time. Shall I go out this way or shall I go out this way? I'm going out and I'd like to join you. I've got a way out that way and I've got a way out this way. I think I'll go this way. See you later. This is the River Thames in London and just here it's where a little place called Deptford Creek enters the river. And the reason I'm by the river is because I want to tell a story in which there is a river. And I'd like to tell this story which comes from Iran. There was a town in Iran right by a river and along the river there was a long street. The town was basically a long street and there was a merchant who lived in this town. Now he lived at the far end of the street very close to the river and he had a little um, a little stall, a little shop front, which is the way people do things in Iran and in India and in Africa. You have metal shutters which come up and they close down and you're open to the street and people come and they buy what, what you have. But the problem was that his little shutter shop, his little stall, was right at the end of the long street. And the main part of the market was in the middle of the street. So all the people bought all their things in the middle of the street in the main part of the market. 
and by the time, if they were interested in walking to the end of that street, they came to his shop, well, they didn't buy anything because they'd bought everything. And they passed his shop by, even if they walked to the end of the street, which often they didn't. So he was very poor. All his stock was old. He hadn't sold things. Um, people didn't want it because it looked old. But the one thing that was good in his life was his daughter. He had a young daughter. She was about 12 years old. And she was pretty. And her name reflected her beauty. Her name was Gul Bahar. And Gul means flower. And Bahar means spring. So her name meant she was the flower of the spring. And for him, she was the flower of his life and brought happiness. Since he had no wife, he was a widower. He and his daughter passed their days trying to do what they could to earn some money. Well, it happened that one day a rich merchant, a man in very good clothes, he was obviously wealthy, he walked past the little store and then he walked back again. But on the third time that he walked, he didn't walk past, he stopped. And he said to the poor merchant, I see that you're not doing very well. I see that uh, you're not selling anything. I'd like to help you. Oh, that's very kind of you, sir. Very kind indeed, yes. I'd like to give you some money, to give you a start, maybe you'll be able to buy some more stock and sell some more things and you'll be a bit more successful he said and he glanced over the shoulder of the poor man to whom he was speaking and he saw Gulbaha I see your daughter's looking a bit thin she could do with a, a few good meals here take this money oh no I couldn't possibly take your money sir because you see I could never pay you back pay me back don't talk about paying me back. Just take this money. I want you to have it. Well, the rich man was so insistent that the poor merchant took the money and the rich man went away. Well, time passed. A year, two years, five years had passed. And the poor man had almost forgotten the rich merchant because now once more, five years later, he was poor again. Because even though he bought a new stock, people didn't come to his shop. He wasn't selling. He couldn't sell. And so there again, he was poor. And that was his life. Until one day, the rich merchant came back. And the rich merchant said, I want my money. But you, you said uh, whatever I said. I gave you money five years ago and I would like my money back. Uh, well, I'm very poor. I, I couldn't pay your money back um, just at the moment. Uh, you, you said whatever I said. You owe me money. I would like my money back now. I can't give it to you. I don't have the money. Okay, if you don't have the money, I'll tell you what you can do. Your daughter. I'll take your daughter. I'll marry your daughter. And then you don't have to pay your debt at all. Now, when he said, I'll take your daughter, I'll marry your daughter, the poor man's heart sank. She was so young. And he said to, to the rich man, but she's so young. She's... 17 she she has not had a life and she's so young and he didn't say you're so old but he did say and you're much older than she is oh please please don't make me marry her to you you have a choice i'll take your daughter or i'll take your money oh oh she's the she's the she's so important to me i couldn't possibly and i i'm a reasonable man said the rich man. I tell you what I'll do. Let fate, let destiny, let luck decide what will happen. I'll go to the river and I'll take two stones. I'll put them in a bag. One will be white and one will be black. And she will put her hand into the bag 
And if she chooses a black stone, she will marry me. But if she chooses a white stone, then she is free not to marry me, and you will not have to pay your debts. Either way, you won't have to pay your debts. Now Gulbahar was upstairs in her little room, which was above the shop, and she heard everything. And she saw the rich merchant go to the river. Now the rich merchant took two stones from the river. No one saw him, except, of course, Gulbahar, who could see from her window exactly what he did. And the two stones he picked, instead of one white one and one black one, were both black. And he put them into the bag. By now, a group of people had gathered around because they wanted to know all what fuss was all about. And so the rich merchant stood by the river and he said, Come, let your daughter choose one of the stones. Well, the, the poor merchant went to the river and Gulbahar, as she came down the stairs, she was thinking, What can I do? I can refuse and, and I can accuse him. I can say, I can say, but if I accuse him of, of playing a trick, he's rich, he's, he's wealthy, everybody knows him, he'll find some way of getting out. If I refuse, then my father will be in a bad situation. If I choose a black stone. As she was thinking this, all the options seemed to be wrong until she came to where the two merchants were standing. And she put her hand into the bag. And as she put her hand into the bag, she picked up one of the stones, which of course she knew was black because they were both black. And she held it in her hands as if she was pleading for it to be a white stone. She was just play acting. And she did this and then she put the hands, her hands behind her and she dropped the stone into the river. Oh, silly me, I've dropped the stone. Now no one will know which stone I picked. Oh yes, silly you, said all the people. Look, nobody will know which stone you picked now. But then Gulbahar said, but there's a way out. We know that the stone in the bag is not the one that I chose. So whichever the white or the black stone is in the bag, the opposite one will be the one that I chose first. Yes, that's a good idea, said the people. But the rich merchant now knew that his nasty trick had failed. I will do it said Gulbahar. I'm ready to do it. And the rich merchant held the bag. And Gulbahar put her hand in. And of course she took out a black stone and everyone cheered. She took the white stone the first time and so she doesn't have to marry the merchant. And the merchant looked at the people, knowing that he could do no more than walk away from that place, having promised that the poor merchant must never pay back his debt, and that Gulbahar didn't have to marry him. And he never bothered them again. And the merchant and his daughter lived happily ever after. Well, that song was from, that story, sorry, I'm going to do a song in a minute. The story was from Iran. Um, but the next story, which I recorded yesterday outside on the hill near me, just behind me, the story comes from the Amazon. And the Amazon could be Brazil or Peru or Ecuador or Colombia. The Amazon is in all of these countries. But before telling the story, I'd like to sing a song. And I'm going to accompany myself on these little chime bars. 
and the song is about an owl and many other, other things that are found in the Amazon. An owl in that part of the world is called Murukututu. Beside the Morundu, Morukututu, de trás de Morundu, eu vejo a cilha velha lá da banda do Angu. I see the old old lady by the shores of the Angu. Jacare tutu, jacare mandu, alligator wild, alligator cruel. Alligator, go away, don't take my little child. Morukututu. 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 So now, sorry, I keep looking over there. Now it's time for the story. So out I'm going this way this time. Here I am in the beautiful woods just behind my house at a place called Nunhead Cemetery on Telegraph Hill in London where I live. And I'm in the woods because I want to tell a story about people. People who lived in the woods who lived in the forest, who lived in the Amazon forest many, many, many years ago. This was a time when the people who lived in the village would go into the forest hunting. But everybody would go, man, woman, child. The whole village would go into the forest hunting because that way they were safe. At night, when they came home to the village, they closed that big gate that they had made. The gate made just as the fence was made, with thorns, but huge long thorns, not just little teeny weeny thorns, huge long thorns. And the reason was that the animals that they hunted in the day, at night, they would come to hunt the people unless they were safe behind their circle of thorns, their fence which was built right around the village with long pointed thorns. At night time that gate was closed and on the gate there were thorns sticking out to keep the animals away. Well one day as the people were preparing to go out hunting, the great gates were opened and all the people, all the men and all the women and all the children left and walked into the jungle. Everyone except one. And that, because, that was because a man who was walking out of the gates, he saw on the ground a stick. Well, you might think, a stick in the jungle, in the forest, you find sticks everywhere. Well, yes, you do. But this stick was perfectly straight. Without a bend, without a knot, it was a long stick that was straight. Now, that's unusual in a forest because usually the sticks have little twigs or something like that, but not this one. So he picked up that stick and he looked at it this way, he looked at it that way, and he looked at it this way. But as he looked this way, he could see that the stick was hollow. So he lifted the stick from his eye and he was going to put it down, but just as he was putting it down, he had a bit of a cough and he coughed. <coughs> But through the stick, another sound came. As he coughed, <coughs> ooh, 
so he made another sound. Boop. Boop. Well, this was amazing. This stick made a sound. Boop. And as he was making this sound, with his little finger he was making, with the nail of his finger he made a little hole. Well, it was a different sound. So he put his finger on the hole. Ooh, 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 ooh. He made another hole. Ooh, 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 He made another hole. And before you knew it, he'd made holes all along that stick, and he was making this sound. <laughs> Up in the trees, the birds, they looked at each other, and they landed on the branches. And they said to each other, Look, that man down there, he speaks bird. And all the birds, they came down, and they landed in the sand outside the fence where he was now sitting with this stick. And all the birds, big birds, little birds, red birds, yellow birds, green birds, every colour of the forest birds, Amazonian birds, multicoloured birds, they were sitting and they were listening to this man who could make the sound of the birds. And that went on all day. So fascinated was he with the stick, and so fascinated were the birds with him and his stick and his sons. But as the day wore on, all the other people came back from hunting, and they weren't very happy, because they had been hunting all day, and they hadn't found anything at all. And when they came back to the village, they were very, very in a bad humour. And as they... When they came back to the village, they saw one of their own people, the man with the stick, making this sound. And all these birds, mm, they licked their lips and they took out their bows and they took out their arrows and... <laughs> And arrows flew, 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 flew through the air. And <laughs> all the birds lay dead. Well, the man, who had been quite happy to play his little sound on his little stick and to have all the birds, he didn't think this was right. They were hunters. They go into the forest, they take their luck. Sometimes they find things, sometimes they don't find things. But to kill the birds like this... All the people took the birds and they plucked out all the feathers and they cooked the birds. They roasted the birds, they baked the birds, they boiled the birds, they fried the birds. They did everything with the bird to cook it, everything you possibly could. The only thing they didn't have was bird on toast. Mm, that night they'd eaten well. And the feathers they stuck in their hair and they stuck in their, in their, on their bodies, in their clothes, and they were covered in the grease of bird fat dripping down. They'd had a great feast. And on the next night, they had another feast because there were plenty of birds. And on the third night, they had another last feast. And on the fourth day and the fourth night, they couldn't eat anything because they were so full. <coughs> but on the fifth day, they went to the man and they said, that stick you've got, get it out, make that sound, bring those birds and we'll kill them and we won't have to go hunting. And the man said, no. No? What do you mean, no? It's an easy way for us to get those birds and to kill them and to eat them. Now do it. Get your stick. Make that sound. Bring those birds. We'll kill them and eat them. OK? Now he was starting to feel a bit nervous. Because he didn't want 
animals to be hunted in this way. And he knew that if he refused, he would be in trouble. But he found himself saying again, No. And they said, You get that stick. This is your third try, and you know what will happen to you if you disobey us. Now his heart was trembling. He was really nervous, but he couldn't do it, and he said, no. And in that place, the punishment for anyone who did anything that was unforgivable, and this was unforgivable, Anyone who did anything wrong, and this was wrong. Anyone who did anything against the will of the greater good of the people, and this was against the will of the greater will of the people. They were put outside the fence of thorns at night, when the wild animals came to see what they could eat. The doors were open. He was put outside. The doors were closed and the thorns were sticking out. He couldn't get back into the village. And it was six o'clock. And in the Amazon at six o'clock it gets dark very quickly. And he sat there, trembling, thinking of the wild animals that would come and eat him. I've done this to myself and I've done this because of this stick. So maybe this is the only thing I can do. And he picked up his stick and he put it to his mouth and he started making the sounds in the pitch dark of the Amazonian forest. <laughs> but then in the darkness he saw in front of him about the level of his knees, two little lights. And then he saw two more lights. And then he saw at the tree level, two little lights and two more and two more and two more. And then right on the ground, two little lights coming closer towards him. And these tiny little lights were coming closer and closer and closer. All over, everywhere he looked, there were little tiny pairs of lights. But of course they weren't pairs of lights at all. They were pairs of eyes, and those were the eyes of the animals of the forest, the birds of the air, and the slithery, slimy, slidey things of the ground, and the animals who walked on four legs. They all came towards him and listened, and all night long he... <laughs> And all night long they were transfixed. And as the first light of dawn started to appear above the canopy of the trees and penetrate through the leaves, those lights just before it came light, those little eyes retreated back into the forest and disappeared. <laughs> Oh, oh, the people in the village were waking up and their first thought was, let's go and see what's left of that man who wouldn't do what we wanted him to do. And they opened their big gates expecting to see maybe a little bit of hair because animals don't eat hair. They crunch bones, they eat flesh. Maybe toenails is something else they don't eat. Maybe we will find a toenail or two, maybe we will find a bit of hair, but he deserved it. And as they walked out, <coughs> excuse me, as they walked out, they saw the man was there. And they realized that his stink was magic. And they realized they could use this magic. And they said, oh, um, we wanted you to uh, bring the animals and we wanted, we punished you because you didn't, but, but um, we, we'll try not to, um, uh, uh, please, um, uh, sorry. Sorry. Well, yes, we realize you've got something very important and please, please forgive us. Um, stay with us. We'll make sure you're okay. 
and he decided that he didn't want to stay in a place where the people wanted him to use his new stick in a wrong way because he thought it was wrong to lure the animals like that and to kill them in a defenseless way and he walked out of that village never to return and he walked through the jungle and he walked from clearing to clearing and every place that he came to every village that he came to people were interested in his stick and he went from place to place showing people how to make the first musical instrument that existed in the world and that story is from the Amazon and I learned it from my friend and storyteller Sharon Jacksteez. Well I, here I am again I hope you're not getting dizzy with me coming and going all the time but I just thought I'd like to show you a little bit of where I live and the next story comes from Bangladesh and it was told to me by my friend and colleague Shamim Azad. She is a poet and a storyteller and we've done quite a lot of work in the East End of London bringing all the different communities who live there bringing them together and sharing stories and this is one of her stories and it comes as I probably said from Bangladesh. There was a poor boy he didn't have a home. He used to sleep under the trees. And one day he slept under a tree which has a fruit. It's a Bangladeshi fruit. It's called a look looky tree. And the fruit is look looky. Now the tree didn't have any fruit on it apart from one little look looky. Now look looky are very sweet. And he went to sleep because he was tired but just before he fell to sleep he looked up and he saw that there was just one of the look looky fruits on the tree but he was tired it was the middle of the day but he needed his afternoon nap and he went to sleep well as you know sometimes when we fall to sleep our mouth falls open and when he was sleeping and when his mouth was wide open he had a dream and he really was a little bit hungry and wanted something tasty and he thought oh I wish I could have that look looky because I can't reach it it's too high and there's only one anyway but the dream was as if he was eating a look looky tree a uh, look looky fruit and not a tree although that comes later he thought he was eating a look looky fruit but what actually happened as he was lying there with his mouth open the look looky had become ripe enough for it to fall and it fell right into his mouth so he actually was eating the fruit of the look looky mm -hmm. it was delicious oh yum 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 mm. But when he woke up, he discovered something because he had eaten the look looky, but he'd also swallowed the pip, the stone. It had gone right down into his belly. And when he woke up, he found growing out of his belly was a look looky tree, not a big one, but covered in fruit. Ooh. he took one delicious he took another mm. now the look looky fruit when you get it you have to roll it so it doesn't drip everywhere and you roll it into a ball when you peel it mm, you spit out the pip but he was having such a wonderful time eating all these fruits until he couldn't eat any more but there was still plenty and he thought I'll take it down to the market and see if I can sell some and it was a success because everyone wanted some of his sweet look looky fruit and he made quite a bit of money he put the money in his pocket and now it was the end of the day he went back to the tree 
He'd got his own tree there, but he went to sleep. Now, some people had seen him, and they were jealous that they made, he'd made all this money from Nook Looky. So they came along in the night and chop and chop and chop, and they chopped the Look Looky tree down. And when he woke up, there was no Look Looky tree coming out of his belly, but there was a tree stump, and growing all around the tree stump were mushrooms. They were good. He took another, and once more he went to the market. He sold all his mushrooms. It was a success. He had a pocket full of money. He put it in his pocket, and he went home and he had another sleep. Now those same people were jealous that he'd got all these mushrooms. We thought we'd got rid of that look looky tree. Let's dig out that tree trunk. And they got spades and they got forks and they got shovels and they dug out the tree stump. And in the night, it started to rain. It rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. So that when he woke up in the morning, there was no look looky tree, there was no tree stump. There was a lake, there was a pond, and in the pond there were fish swimming. Carp. Carp are very, very good fish to eat. He went to the market, very careful not to spill <laughs> any of the water. When he got to the market, he sold all of the fish, and he came home that night, same thing, went to sleep, those same jealous people came and filled his stomach. He filled his belly, filled that hole with water, but they filled it with, the hole had water in it, but they filled it with soil. Well, when he woke up in the morning, with the heat of the Bangladeshi sun and the soil and the water in the soil, there was a rice paddy it was full of rice and he thought this was fabulous. He took the rice and he sold the rice and the next day the same. Those people didn't come back because they thought they'd finished filling his stomach with soil. That was it. He took the rice and he sold it and then the rice was so delicious that eventually he started using that rice and cooking it and he made a little restaurant and every day he had plenty of rice to cook and every day he had plenty of customers to come and eat his delicious rice and that was the story of the boy who had the look looky tree who lived happily and successfully and with enough money ever after. So, story from Bangladesh, what's next? We're going out one more time. I hope you're not dizzy from it. And we have a story from Argentina. There's my telephone, better go. I'm on a hill in London. I'm overlooking St. Paul's Cathedral. It's right there in the distance. It might not look very clear, and it might be a bit shaky, but this is where I'm starting this story. So here I am on that hill above London. Down there below is St Paul's Cathedral and the City of London. And the reason I'm at a high place is because I want to sing a song or tell a story from a high place. And that high place is the High Andes in Argentina in a place called Jujuy, where one of our storytellers in World Storytelling Cafe comes from. Her name is Graciela, and I want to dedicate this little song story to her. I'm going to do the first little bit in Spanish, but don't worry, there are things in it that will keep you interested. Only a little bit in Spanish, and the rest in English. Are you ready? Había una vez una vaca en la quebrada de Humahuaca como era muy vieja, muy vieja 
estaba sorda de una oreja y a pesar que ya era abuela un día quiso ir a la escuela se puso unos zapatos rojos guantes de tul y un par de anteojos la maestra la vio asustada y dijo estás equivocada la vaca le respondió porque no puedo estudiar yo porque no puedo estudiar yo porque no puedo estudiar yo well i think we better do it in english don't you in the mountains of high argentina there was a cow whose name was Mina, and as she was now very old, she couldn't quite hear the things she was told. And even though she was a gran, to go to school was her big plan. She put on a pair of red shoes, nice clean white gloves, and specks on her nose. The teacher, she said, she looked a bit shaken and said my dear i think you're mistaken the cow answered her in return saying why can't i come here and learn so dressed up in buttons and bows she took her place in one of the front rows we children were so impolite laughing and giggling oh what a sight the people became quite intrigued to visit the cow who wanted to read. They started arriving in hordes, in lorries and planes, and even skateboards. And as the fuss got more and more, we children stopped learning, we sat on the floor. The cow all alone in the corner read out her lesson just like jack horner we children began to feel wonky each one of us turned into a donkey and in that place in high argentina the only one clever was a cow called mina in a place in high argentina the only one clever was a cow called mina very well done mina thank you bye 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 <laughs>